Greetings, friends. My name is Justin McLean, and I'm here to provide you with some blueprints of disruption. This weekly podcast is dedicated to amplifying the work of activists, examining power structures, and sharing the success stories from the grassroots. Through these discussions, we hope to provide folks with the tools and the inspiration they need to start to dismantle capitalism, decolonize our spaces, and bring about the political revolution that we know we need. In the aftermath of the almost general strike by education workers in Ontario, there's been a lot of discussion on the potential mass actions have and the conditions needed to make them really count. Positive outcomes of collective agreements are great. We can certainly make the argument that they help lift the status quo and and can benefit all workers. But at the same time, we can also acknowledge that those types of gains are incremental. And at this point in the class war, we need more. Our public health care is being driven into the ground. It's well on its way to privatization. Same goes for public education, whose fight goes well beyond CUPE's 55,000 workers. Half a million people in Ontario live in legislated poverty. Food banks have been maxed out. The green belt is being sold off to developers. And undemocratic powers have been given to mayors across the province. Mandate letters might be a secret, but we all know what his plan is now. And it's also clear the only thing Premier Ford and his ilk respond to is sustained collective action. Yet, here we are. Talk of a general strike has vanished yet again. So one couldn't help but see the parallels to the 1995 Days of Action here in Ontario. The best person I could think of to make these comparisons and help draw lessons from them was John Clark, former lead organizer for the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty and now a professor at York University. He very recently authored a piece aptly titled, Doug Ford Underestimated the Power of Workers, But So Did Union Leaders. The discussion draws from that recent piece in Breach Media, as well as his extensive experience organizing with particularly disruptive social movements. I wanted to find out from John how we could ensure that the next general strike centered the voices of the grassroots, the rank and file, how we could get clear demands that would have you know significant impact on those who most need it, and how to push back against neoliberal policies sure to devastate our public sector. Let's listen in. Good afternoon, John. Just take a moment and please introduce yourself to our audience. Yes. Okay. So uh, I'm John Clark, and uh, I've uh, I've been uh, was active for many many years, uh, some 28 years actually, as a, an organizer with the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty, uh, commonly known as OCAP, and um, stepped down a while ago from that uh, from that position. And currently, I'm the Packer Visitor in Social Justice at, uh, at York University. So I, I do a number of things there, including teaching a couple of uh, social justice-related courses. And that's about where I am at the moment. I was really excited when I saw the announcement come through York University. I probably follow you on Facebook as well, where you had that two-year appointment and specifically saw that you were teaching social justice and political activism. I got extra excited because I actually took that course, I don't know how long ago, but Faye Faraday was the professor. And when we opened up the syllabus on day one, you know, the political activism junkie that I am, I was just salivating. It was just like a who's who of activists across Canada. We're going to guest lecture. And it was completely unique from all of the other courses in how it was structured and its topic. But uh, alas, my learning was on the line that year. Uh, the QP 3903 were on strike. So I didn't like really get to take it. So I would like to hear from you, you know, how does one teach social justice and political activism in a classroom setting? Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> there's a couple of things about it. First of all, uh, the, the PACA visitor in social justice is chosen uh, by the PACA committee uh, on the basis of... Uh, not on the basis of academic background. I don't have an academic background. I don't even have a university degree. Uh, but is chosen on the basis of uh, the term is experiential equivalency. So, uh, so having that direct knowledge of social movement struggles is the thing that is the thing that is sought out 
in when they select somebody f- for this. So that's the basis on which I was chosen. So um, the Toronto Sun uh, ran a, a less than wasn't exceptionally vicious, but uh, but a sort of somewhat disparaging piece about the fact that I was taking this position, and the sort of the snarky question was was put: Will he teach? Will he be teaching people how to protest? And in fact, I mean, while very practical, uh, very practical lessons in how to organise the logistics of protest and such like are very, very important in building activism. The course that I put together is actually uh, there are two two courses I'm teaching now, actually, but they're both based on a fairly serious theory, theoretical and historical uh, approach. Um, Certainly the practical experience that I've had over the years in organising is, is of enormous uh, help, I think, in, in making the course useful and, and I hope interesting. But but we do actually grapple with very, very serious questions um, around what social justice struggles represent, what the issues are in society that drive social justice, how it is that people can organise and have influence and win victories, how this system works to limit and contain the struggles that uh, that people take up. Uh, so, and, and in the second course I teach, which is a, which is in, which is based on democracy, um, uh, democracy and protests, um, we go even further in, in sort of examining the ways in which uh, the ways in which this society and its institutions and those for whom those institutions really serve, um, how it has been possible to make substantial concessions, but at the same time broker those concessions in such ways that people's capacity to struggle is limited and the lion's share of what those people in power were defending is, stays in their hands. So those are the kinds of issues that we deal with. And what helps it enormously is the fact that York University's student body is largely working class and and a very very diverse uh, uh, student base. So that means that people come forward who have so many experiences, uh, so much knowledge. It's a it's a cliched thing to say that you teach somebody, you teach a course, and you you learn more than you teach. But it's really actually genuinely true. Uh, it's such an experience. I've learned so much from from interacting with the student body at York University. I'm. I'm terribly jealous that I'm not in these two courses. I imagine there's a whole bunch of people in the audience just salivating at the idea of sitting in or maybe auditing one of these courses because this is knowledge we are all very desperate for, uh, particularly activists that don't know where to start, right? There's a whole lot of people that know things are wrong. They have they are passionate about items but and they organize, but maybe they don't organize effectively. John, you recently sent or a signee in a letter, an open letter to the current folks at OCAP, at the Ontario Coalition uh, Against Poverty. In it, it mentions an OCAP model that perhaps has been strayed from. Do you do you weave this into your course? And, and could you maybe explain it a little bit more, like what differentiates the OCAP model from perhaps the pitfalls that a lot of groups fall into? Yes. Well, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the background was that, the, that a group of us who had been long-time members of OCAP feel that where the organisation is at this moment is not good, and we wanted to alert people to that, hence we wrote this letter. Um, but in, in the course of putting that forward, we counterposed what OCAP had been and as you use the term, the OCAP model, uh, I think I don't think there's necessarily unique qualities uh, at play. But OCAP, as, a, as an anti-poverty organisation, tried to learn certain lessons. And I mean, what it really comes down to, I think, is that if you're trying to organise in communities that are under attack uh, by uh, by poverty, by gentrification, uh, by police brutality, by racism, if you're if you're trying to organize in those communities, there's two essential approaches. And it rather it rather has a bearing on how you view the state power. Right? If you think that the state and governments are sort of honest brokers of the common good who sometimes lose their way and need some 
eloquent briefs and uh, and uh, powerful submissions at their committees to to get them back on track and educate them. Um, and then primarily what you're involved in is an exercise in trying to lobby. You, know, you get on first name uh, terms with assistant deputy ministers, and you uh, and, and you try to uh, you try to have a positive influence. Uh, the term has been used: constructive engagement. Uh, there's an alternative view of uh, there's an alternative view which sees this state uh, this state power as primarily something that is in the service of of the rich, of the capitalist, of the bankers. And, and you don't expect it to be impartial. You expect it to wade in to the extent that it can on the side of those with the economic power and the resources, in which case you organize differently. You don't try to be a, a polite voice of, of, of reason. You don't try to be a, a voice of, of, uh, of conscience. Uh, you actually try to organize a counter power. And that counter power for poor people, that part of the working class that has uh, – only a precarious or no contact with the workforce that is not in a position to organize uh, strikes and such like. The alternative form of pressure that the poor can bring is disruptive collective action, right? To organize in ways that actually disrupt the institutions that oppress them. Um, and that gives you a certain power. Uh, if, uh, if a a social uh, benefits office is denying people benefits outrageously um, and you bring 50 people down to that office and disrupt the workings of the office, then by definition, bureaucracies don't like disruption and uh, you're likely to be accommodated. You're likely to get your demands met. And so uh, there were two uh, important uh, US uh, writers uh, Francis Fox Piven and Richard A. Cloud, who wrote a book, and they had themselves a grounding in poor people's movements. And they put it really brilliantly when they said that the main way in which the poor can have political influence is through their ability to create crises by disrupting institutions. And uh, that sort of sums up the, the, the idea of the OCAP model. The term direct action has frequently been used with regards to OCAP. And certainly we did put a premium on direct action. But, uh, but that was a tool. Uh, the basic fundamental approach was to organize in ways that were challenging, that were disruptive, that created a problem for people living in poverty and that therefore gave people some power. Uh, and it was an effective model, uh, and it remains an effective model in my view, and it's something to uh, something to draw some lessons from. It seems unfair that the uh, the alternative model was gets the constructive label because, like you say, it's probably far more effective to be disruptive. Of course, we have a bias here. I mean, the name of the show is Blueprints of Disruption because clearly I'm in that second boat where very disillusioned with electoral politics and the abilities to really make an impact or bring about the transformation we need through those avenues. And listening to you reminds me of how frustrated, too, I get with the way folks try to appeal to Ford. Um, even sometimes the approach is to have someone fired, a minister fired, as though it's an individual problem and not a systemic one. And like so much effort sometimes goes into campaigns to replace ministers or premiers. And um, I find that very frustrating because it doesn't strike at the ideology that's at the root of it all that will just be replaced. You recently wrote an article you talked about earlier in the conversation here. You talked about the concessions that sometimes capital and the ruling class make. And they're often strategic in terms of you, you talk about that in your breach article when mentioning bargaining power and how that ebbs and flows. And uh, I just want to pull this up here. So bear with me. I have a quote here from your article that I was just I've read it so many times because I think it just you said everything that we were all feeling and still feeling now in terms of perhaps lost potential. So for folks who haven't read it, I mean, the title really says it all. Doug Ford underestimates the power of workers, but so did union leaders. And I, I'll just add a, an, an addendum to that. Uh, not just workers, right? He didn't, I think both parties also underestimated the power of 
folks outside of the labor force that played an impact and that came out in in large numbers and, and organized in their communities. I think it really did kind of spark a fire in, in the province. In the article, though, John, you do have a bright spot that I feel like might have been snuffed out a little bit. Now, you have two bright spots, and, and we'll touch on both of them. But the first one I just want to revisit because QP has since issued another strike notice. Apparently, Ford did not go back to that negotiating table in good faith. Do you feel in your article, you kind of say what one of the bonuses was that he should be humbled in his position, right? Knowing the power that could be unleashed. And do you still feel that way? Um, seeing them kind of fail at the negotiating table again? Well, yeah, I mean, I can't say the way it's played out is an enormous surprise. Nonetheless, uh, I, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll deal, I'm sure, with the, the, the negative side of things, uh, which have to be explored in terms of how far short that movement, that movement went, has gone so far in terms of what could have been achieved. But, but still, I, I think it's very far from a situation that people have been crushed in the way that was uh, in the way that Ford intended to, or, or, or have made no gains at all. Absolutely, there's been a, a, a round. Although they're still going to negotiate over the weekend, so by Monday, who knows what the situation will be? But, but nonetheless. Rather unsurprisingly, he didn't put a uh, an anti austerity package on the table. Uh, that's that's not entirely surprising. But nonetheless, the very fact that, that this man who wanted to pass legislation to crush uh, a worker's struggle and impose on them a contract of his choosing, uh, dictating the terms of it, uh, and setting a, a precedent to 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 move uh, on an offensive against public sector workers and public services uh, virtually unchallenged uh, with unlimited power he's been significantly humbled and he's forced into a bargaining process that he thought he would he'd snuffed out the necessity for so so I, I think we have to we have to consider both sides of the contradiction fully and and uh, the struggle is ongoing. It still has enormous possibilities. It's not beaten by any manner of means. It's it's sold itself short, I, I think, in my opinion. But it hasn't it hasn't been defeated, and the struggle is magnificent, regardless. I think one hundred percent there, John. And and one of the bright spots I said there were two. Uh, the other one is you can't argue with is not only Ford has been shown that massive power that can be unleashed when needed. The people of Ontario, right, start to self-realize the power. Uh, I'm going to quote you again there. To those who don't appreciate the enormous latent strength of working people, it appeared to be a situation where Goliath had little to fear from David. That is not so much the case anymore. And sometimes it's self-realization that is the true power. Uh, Ford might have miscalculated what QP was willing to do. That was fun to read the quote where we just didn't think they would strike illegally, you know, like that just we didn't calculate for that. And that that's amusing to me because I think a lot of us assumed that, too. It was a very pleasant surprise to see that that show of force in particular Opsu's following of that solidarity. You know, that wasn't something we had seen in a long time. And you know, I feel like people should go read the article, but I might end up reading half of it to you because I think this this line here is very hopeful. Um, the class struggle is so explosive precisely because it involves periods of relative quiet and even retreat that conceal accumulating anger and increasing social tensions. I think some people, as it got quiet again, lost hope. But this is all part of the process, is it not, John? Yes, it, it certainly is. I mean, uh, you know, for quite some time now, people have been looking back to the Ontario days of action in the 1990s against the Harris Tories and, and suggested uh, and, and suggested that this was a level of organising that was now completely beyond our grasp, that 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 no kind of generalised working class struggle uh, was possible in the present uh, context. And uh Albeit that the thing was called off before it had gathered all of the momentum and strength that it could, it was clear that there was going to be uh, there was going to be uh, 
an ongoing strike in defiance of government legislation, that there were going to be massive sympathy strikes by union allies. Moreover, even the official opinion polls were showing that a majority of people were on the side of that struggle. And there's no question that it would have resonated deeply. It would have it would have actually, beyond union struggles, as vital as they are, it would have galvanized the resistance of communities under attack. Uh, it, it, it was an absolutely historic moment that, that achieved a great deal, but had, that had possibilities to go way, way beyond where it did. I'm glad you mentioned the days of action. You do draw comparisons, as everyone seems to be doing in the wake of that, that almost general strike. So for folks who aren't aware what the days of action were, can you give us an idea from a somewhat insider perspective as well? I think the unique part about what we just recently saw with the education workers is we kind of understood the process. There was a bargaining that was happening. It didn't go well. There were demands met, charter rights stripped, and a, a specific union went on strike. We could kind of follow that. And then everyone's tweeting, the leaders are tweeting, we can follow as this escalates and doesn't go well. But with the days of action, it, it wasn't such a clear, you know, it wasn't around a collective bargaining agreement. How did this shape up? Because we've been under attack in Ontario for quite some time under Ford, and we've not seen a whole lot of action like that. Um, it did take a severe infringement of worker rights to a large union to finally see someone step up against Ford. You know, how did you folks manage that? Well, I mean, the days of action were, I mean, as much as Ford is engaged in a vicious austerity agenda, attacking public services, attacking workers. I, I, Harris represented the sort of the Margaret Thatcher approach. Uh, you know, the uh, what uh, the singer Billy Bragg has called the short, sharp shock. Uh, it was one of those moments when when a government came to power with a determined agenda that and was not going to back down and, and, and started absolutely obliterating things. I mean, uh, Ford has the same viciousness, but not the same backbone, I, I feel. He's, he's been erratic. And so it's been a, a somewhat more, it's been a somewhat more complicated and, and, and difficult situation to confront for. Harris was just brutal and unrelenting. And when he first came to power, there wasn't, in fact, um, an immediate determination to confront him. A, a great number of the union leaders were actually talking in terms of, you know, some of them, a lot of our members voted for him. There's not much we can do at the moment. We're going to... Uh, that sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah. But, but um, the lead was actually given by community organisations with OCAP playing its own modest role in that regard. And, and uh, uh, that resonated. It resonated very, very strongly. And it became clear that the unions were going to, or a section of the unions were interested in throwing their weight into that kind of defiant, generalised resistance, uh, bringing those things together. And so the days of action emerged. And I, I mean, let me first of all say that the days of action revealed a power that was absolutely breathtaking. I mean, there were, there were strikes organised that were clearly... Uh, a violation of the existing labour relations legislation uh, that were clearly illegal, obviously for their own protection. Unions use various formulations about protest and such like, but I think we can say here amongst friends that they were clearly illegal strikes. Uh, they were localised general strikes, city by city general strikes. And then there was a, an outpouring of protest numbers that was absolutely breathtaking. I mean, the, 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 I got to uh, be a speaker at some of these events and I remember getting up in Hamilton and looking out over the crowd and I'd never seen anything like it in my life. I could rapidly have been convinced that 50% of the population of the earth was there. It was just like, it was, it was, it was incredible, uh, the power that was, uh, that was generated and, and that was unleashed. But I also think it's necessary to point out that the same contradictions were at work during the days of action that were that would work in the recent education workers' struggle. In that what you had was, yes, a recognition of the fact that an attack was taking place that was so serious that it was going to be necessary to a limited degree 
to step outside of the regulated norms of labor legislation, right? That they were going to have to be defiant actions that, that broke the rules. Uh, and that happened to a significant degree. But the hesitation that, that went into it was also a very major part of the days of action. Sometimes the whole thing gets a bit romanticized. But I think we need to recognize how far short that campaign went from what it could have been, right? I mean, first of all, you would have these incredible mobilizations in a given city. And then at the end, no one would get up and say, the plan is this. The next step is this. Our objective is to defeat this government. Our objective is to make it impossible for them to implement their agenda. Uh, it was just what are we doing? Well, we're raising a voice of protest. Where are we going to go next? Well, we'll have some discussions and we'll see. Maybe we'll shut down the province. Maybe we'll just shut down a provincial park. We haven't decided yet. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it. And, and so there was this vacillation and hesitation and reluctance to escalate it to something decisive uh, that, that in the end, the thing ran out of steam. It was, it was wound down before it should have been. It didn't achieve what it should have been. And that's the other side of the days of action. And the same mechanisms, I think, were at work in the education workers' struggle. I want to hit on a few points that you brought up there, especially we'll start off with the lack of demands, clear demands that came out of the days of action. That's very similar to the Occupy movement that I was involved in. A lot of us were involved in we knew what we didn't want, but were very poor in articulating any kind of demands. Uh, it wasn't terribly disruptive. You know, I think the main action was essentially we just took over a park. But that was a huge part of it. And I can't even imagine how we would come to clear demands just the way that we were structured. So I'm curious, in the days of action, like how was that decision-making process structured? Because... Again, we'll, we keep hopping between things, but in our current day with the general strike with education workers, we knew who was calling the shots, right? Um, whether we were disappointed in their decision or not, you know, that's playing kind of armchair quarterback, which I'm happy to do. But it's not so clear to me in the days of action and same with the Occupy movement. It was a really, what was it like, John? Yeah, I mean, the Occupy movement failed to articulate demands by choice. That that was certainly, you know, that was certainly the perspective of the initiators, Um and I would say that was a that was a political mistake, but in that sense, it was an honest political mistake. It was a it was a, a set of beliefs. It was a perspective that I would criticise. But it was, you know, I think, with the days of action, the hesitation came from something different. I think with the days of action, what we were dealing with was uh, a trade union leadership that operates within a framework of state sanctioned compromise, and uh, and that compromise is breaking down because the other side has revoked the deal. But because uh, they're not making concessions. On the contrary, they're taking away from unions. They're weakening unions. They're driving, uh, they're driving us down. But that notion that the struggle will be limited, it will be compartmentalized, it will be kept within the framework of individual collective agreements, that there won't be generalized forms of working class resistance, um, that deal is 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 a whole field of operations for uh, for the entire trade union leadership and apparatus, and stepping outside of that is a very risky and scary proposition for them, and so I think they looked over the edge of the cliff, and they had facing something so vicious as the Harris Common Sense uh, Revolution, they had no choice I think but to take to go further than they wanted to, but I was struck by the fact that. You know, when you got to the metro days of action in Toronto and you had this incredible mobilization, I, I listened very carefully to speeches that day. And it was clear that that's as far as they were prepared to go to a, to a, to a very huge degree. They were they they were they were actually scared by the incredible possibilities of what they'd unleashed and, 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 and didn't want to go any further. Um so I think you could say exactly the same about the education workers' strike. It seems inexplicable at one level why you have a movement that has Ford reduced to a blithering, whimpering idiot uh, saying, OK, I'll, I'll withdraw the legislation just, uh, and offering this. I mean, had at that, at that point they said, no, 
uh, a strike is underway, if you have an offer to put on the table, put it on the table and we'll consider it. But we don't take down our picket line in the middle of a strike. And if you try to use that legislation, Ford would have been in a terrible position at that moment. That's from a tactical point of view, that seems self-evident. But the point is that when he offered that compromise, it gave the opportunity to return to that edifice of compromise. And uh, and that, I think, was was seized upon. Um, and that's the that's the weakness that's been at play all through the uh, all through the game uh, in terms of the that's the common thread between the days of action and the uh, and the calling off of the struggle of the education workers in, in in my view. That's frustrating for me to hear. Like you can see me shaking my head. I'm sure because we could feel it, right? We could feel the possibilities. And although perhaps Harris had a different approach. Living through Ford and COVID, I think, really got a lot of people, particularly on the left, eager for action because it's it's usually sold as, you know, it has to get worse before it gets better. People have to have almost nothing to lose before they're willing to risk it all. And it just seemed like a lot of places were there. A lot of social movements must have felt that, but a lot of unions had also been stepped on minimum wage workers and and we had seen almost nothing so then we we were like all right we're here it finally took you know him using the notwithstanding clause you don't know you know when fred hog like you don't know what you started and we're going yes you do yes we do yes we do and um watching that press conference you know i can see their faces and and you just knew immediately from the time the camera came on what they were going to announce i hadn't been on twitter i was just waiting for this and uh yeah lost potential for sure because even going into this next possible strike on monday i don't feel that same anticipation even in me let alone in the community around me you know and to see the poll numbers so promising at that point you can't always replicate that um people then get tired or the narrative's able to shift because there's such a communications machine for a nation. You know, it, it doesn't take them long to get people to turn on teachers. I, I guess it disappoints me extra because the way Days of Action was described as having folks like OCAP at the forefront to a degree and other social movements, but yet it ended up being curtailed by labor. And I did an episode on health coalitions. Uh, Peter Bergamanis of the London Health Coalition came on and talked about how I always thought they were just doctors and nurses that formed those coalitions, but they're not. They're just regular people who understand the need to defend public health care. And I said, like, at what point does it have to get before you folks will escalate your tactics? And his response was, we all want to. But a big part of the health coalitions is also labor leaders because they represent the workers. And so they hold us back. They usually water down anything we want to do. And I mean, how do we get through that? I think that's why I called you on the show, John, because I feel like you hold not like you alone, but you have an idea on how to bring other movements into the fold and maybe have them lead the way because we've got 500,000 people in Ontario that are on ODSP and from organizing even amongst the NDP I know that there's a lot of disabled activists out there that are ready to do a lot and they organize a lot but they're not like unionized it's not like a defined collective you know you have a little bit of experience in unionizing what members of the population previously thought ununionizable. <laughs> I don't know if that's a word, but you know, like some, there's some workplaces where we're told, oh, that's, that's not possible to unionize. You know, they're too mobile, your workforce, the turnover is too high. But in the early eighties, you unionized unemployed folks. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And because I think that holds a lot of potential. Yeah, that was my first uh, experience in, uh, in in organising outside of the work outside of the workforce. I'd been involved in trade unions uh, both uh, in uh, the UK before I came here, and then when I got to Canada, um, and um, in, I moved to London, Ontario, and found myself working in a in a factory, a unionised factory, and found myself personally 
unemployed. So uh, got involved in an initiative to form a union of unemployed workers. And the London Union of Unemployed Workers became one of the, the building blocks of the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty later. So we started to organise people who were unemployed. Uh, we started to put demands to, we started to represent people and we started to act collectively and we started to challenge uh, uh, the unemployment insurance system, the uh, social services system, and we started those kinds of those kinds of collective actions that that led to uh, that led to uh, contributed to the formation of the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty. And yes, it, it was an exercise in trying to organise a portion of the working class population that found itself outside of uh, outside of the uh, the job market, the, the workforce, uh, primarily for reasons of unemployment. But uh, as we uh, but as we started to uh, uh, organise, we found ourselves bringing in uh, disabled people excluded from the workforce. We found ourselves uh, organising uh, amongst injured workers and such like. So it became that kind of an initiative. It makes me wonder, I'm writing down here, you know, does reviving OCAP in that spirit you described at the beginning of the episode, could that be a solution to the massive amounts of Ontarians that are struggling to have their issue on the agenda Yes. in terms, because, you know, that was a lot of hopefulness behind the general strike. We knew it was surrounding a collective bargaining agreement. We understood that, but it started to shape up as potentially something more. And then when people started talking about the Ontario days of action, it became even more so right, a possibility that all these other issues that rarely get discussed, that people don't push back on forward enough because it's not as easy for those folks to organize. But, you, you know, the model you described for OCAP seems like a solution of sorts. Well, I mean, there's a huge role for um, there's a huge role for community based organizing communities under attack on a whole uh, a whole range of different communities and a whole range of different injustices that people are are challenging uh, absolutely that's true and, and and the need to build and organize in communities is is absolutely vital and it happens to be the area of work that I've spent most of my time uh, involved in um, having said that there's also an enormous role for trade unions and uh, however, what is clear is that we are now living at a, in a period that makes the, the situation at the time of the days of action look like a relatively mild situation. Right? We're dealing at a time, we're living now at a time of incredible uh, crisis. Uh, we're dealing with a cost of living crisis internationally that is devastating. And, and over it all stands this climate crisis that is producing worse and worse and worse results. So this means that if for years now this kind of state-sanctioned compromise that 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 came up against us at the, uh, in, the in the education workers' strike, if years if that's been a relative impediment, at the moment it's a disaster, right? If we continue to play by the rules of a deal that is dead, we're going to be done for. You know, it's like coming to a knife fight with boxing gloves on. It, it, it's going to be it's going to be impossible to, to to make gains. So we have to break out of that. We have to be prepared to engage in struggles. Of course, people are going to fight for their immediate collective agreements and their workplace situations, and absolutely, that's absolutely vital. But at the same time, we have to build a movement of generalised resistance. And that means that we can't possibly allow injured workers to be abandoned. We can't possibly allow police to, to terrorise racialised communities. Uh, we can't possibly allow people in, in, in indigenous communities to lack clean drinking water. We can't possibly allow people on ODSP, disabled people, to live on incomes that, they, that, that don't keep them alive. Like, we can't tolerate those things. We have to organise to challenge them. And that means putting forward demands that, that represent the interests of all working class people. And that means taking up a struggle that involves all working class people, whether they organise in their workplaces or whether they organise in their communities. And it means breaking the rules. It means defying the rules. And it doesn't just mean sort of reluctantly doing it a little bit. It means doing it as a strategic choice. And, and that's really what we're up against. And that's, 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 that's not going to come from even relatively militant and relatively progressive trade union leaders 
who are just a bit more uh, a bit more to the left than their than some of their colleagues it's going to have to come from the base it couldn't possibly if, if you or i were the were held the top position in a union we wouldn't by ourselves be able to make that transformation it has to come from the base uh, it has to come from the rank and file it has to come from the communities under attack so if there's a way forward uh, it's not just simply a question of you know issuing a critique and saying that some of the trade union leaders involved in this or that struggle made a mistake. It come, it, 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 it's about the process of organising communities and rejuvenating trade unions. You know, when the trade unions were first formed, they were mass operations. Union meetings that took place in Windsor uh, in the period after the, uh, after the great strike of 1945, regular union meetings were enormous affairs. The rank and file was engaged. It was participating. And that's the kind of uh, perspective that we have to have today, I think. Uh, it's, it's absolutely vital. There's no other way forward. But I, I also think that the situation that we are in is one that can build that kind of a leap in consciousness, that kind of a leap in thought and action. Uh, so I think this is a very exciting time. Uh, it's greatly frustrating to see a movement with such possibilities uh, stop short of where it could have been. But this, relatively speaking, is a skirmish in a much bigger fight. And there's a lot of possibilities ahead of us, and we've got to we've got to utilize that, and we've got to we've got to organize accordingly. I think, like when you talk about that that social contract, where we feel like we have to stay within the rules and it, it, very quite limiting. I think Ford perhaps just went too far, and it it's like a lot of other organizations. You know, I'm the NDP is one of them that I've experienced where if you shut off all actual channels, even the faux ones that you put there to waste people's time, if even those are cut off, you know, like he did with the notwithstanding clause, then it becomes clear to both parties that there is no contract anymore. So I, I am drawing hope in the in the fact that, you know, Fred Hahn and Laura Walton and J.P. Hornick, they demonstrated to their members and to Ontario that no unions don't always have to play within the confines of those rules. But from what I understand also that OPSU's rank and file played a huge role in pushing for their union to take that position. So, and I know a lot of people have been doing a lot of work to do what you described there, John, like rejuvenate the labor movement. Yes, absolutely. And um, so although they can't lead it completely. We've seen why, right? Because uh, a lot of people are, are left off of that agenda. But the fact that they're slowly coming along will, I think, embolden all of us a little bit more. Yeah, I guess that's, that's a big theme here on the show is encouraging folks to be more disruptive. Yeah. I mean, if I could just say there, I mean, I, I think the way I presented things, I, I expressed myself badly in the sense that I mean, I was talking about encouraging a work in progress that's actually happening. I, I, I wasn't suggesting that we're in this situation where, oh, my goodness, you know, they're just getting away with it and the rank and file and the people in communities are doing nothing. And that, that if it came across that way, that isn't what I meant to say at all. I, I think there is uh, there is strength there and it is being brought together and it is growing and it is important. But it's simply that it has to go further. You know, we need to be in a situation where, frankly, a bunch of people can't just make the decision that they're going to call off a strike and uh, and, and have a press conference and announce it. Uh, that, that 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 they they need there needs to be a level of accountability and and rank and file control that's much greater, so that such a thing can't happen. That rejuvenation process means means uh, a membership that uh, never mind what Doug Ford thinks. You know what do our members think? <laughs> but you know that that would be I think. The much that that's what we've got to get to. So we've got to create a situation where that uh, strength from the base actually is the dominant factor. Yeah, I think like the best social movements out there have reinvented structures, so to speak, in terms of how we see power or make collective decisions. It's discouraging when you see ones mimicking the kind of colonial structures that unions are. Right? They're they're problematic power structures. So. I guess um, that's a whole other episode in terms of how does one transform the labor movement. But back to your community organizing, you've also done, you know, traditional workplace organizing. What's the main difference between 
the two? Well, I mean, I think the, the immediate strength uh, of people in workplaces is greater. Uh, and uh, the sense of, uh, you know, a collective enemy is right there, very, very clear and obvious. And there's, there's a whole bunch of reasons why the, the working class's greatest organisational achievement has been to organise in the workplace, to organise trade unions. And I don't think you can overcome that. But on the other hand, there are models of community-based resistance that are absolutely incredible. Um, you know, the unemployed movement of the 1930s was a mass movement of people who, who facing the most brutal forms of social abandonment, but people organised brilliantly. Just recently, I mean, let's look at what happened in the depths of the pandemic when the police killed George Floyd in Minneapolis. Like, there was the largest movement of people on the streets, uh, you know, a, a very... Uh, a challenge to racism and police brutality that was that was massive in in, in its scale and and had shook the Trump presidency and you know galvanized the country. So there's an immense strength there too that exists at the uh, that exists at the community level. But if we can bring those things together, right? If we can bring that power together and and, and really turn it into a united movement, and and, and let's of course, I mean. We talk, in some ways, the division, the line between them is an artificial one. I mean, workers work in their, in their workplaces and go home to their communities. People in communities have workplace issues. The, the, the two things, the two things uh, uh, overlap. But the need, is to, the need is, to, is to build a movement that is, that, is, that is fighting on all of those fronts at the same time. It may sound just like such a naive question, but like, how do we do that? How do we bring those different but overlapping groups and movements together and share power in a way that is mutually beneficial, right? And when I say that, I mean one that sidelines perhaps traditional power um, in favor of the base. Yeah, well, I mean, the attainment of the critical mass necessary is, of course, the huge question. And I mean, I believe that the conditions that exist today are 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 favorable to building that kind of large scale that large scale organizing but there are some critical questions that have to be in place one is uh, an organizational question right we have to actually find the forms that can do this uh, you know uh, in the 1930s for example the unemployed organized there wasn't obviously computer technology there wasn't even a great deal of telephones available the people organized on the basis of block committees right so a, a, a given community could mobilize to stop an eviction happening by running down the street knocking on doors there, there were actually they people were actually organized in that way and so i think in our communities united with people in the workplaces there's a need to find uh structures sometimes the word assembly is thrown around or whatever whatever it is but we have to find organizational forms but the other side of it of course is the politics of the thing right i mean we have to have a clear politics we have to have a clear politics that uh that in my opinion um rejects pre rejects the compromise because it rejects the notion that we are going to pay for their crises right the whole approach of the central banks at the moment is to drive up interest rates, uh, weaken workers and impose a de facto wage cut on working class people. And we have to be very clear that we're not prepared to accept that. And uh, that means challenging this system. That means actually an anti-capitalist politics. And, uh, and those things, I think, are, are absolutely essential. There has to be a political orientation, there has to be an organisational form, and there has to be an actual series of demands and strategies that can, that can take the, for, the, the struggle forward. And there's a great deal that has to be uh, worked out as we go. Uh, there's no sort of blueprint for, for how this is going to develop and how this is going to emerge. We didn't know, uh, we didn't know that the education workers were going to be in this situation. Um, we knew that for, for, very, for various reasons, the Premier of Ontario happens to be a, an incompetent, cowardly fool, but we didn't know, we didn't know that 
uh, he was going to bring in that kind of legislation. We didn't know that he was going to invoke the notwithstanding clause. He didn't know that there was going to be this incredible provocation. You can't foresee those developments, but you uh, but you need to be in a position to respond. I can 100 percent relate to that and what you talked about before uh, in terms of the days of action, not having the next steps ready. You know, I myself have organized around critical moments where you knew you could draw on people's anger, frustration, sometimes fear, and get them to act. But that, yeah, it was, it is so crucial to have clear way forward. And half the battle is having those structures in place, maintained by, you know, some precarious employed people or people who are struggling so that when there are those moments, you know, that that surprise us, that we don't anticipate and we're ready to pounce, so to speak, and then hold that pressure. I, I mean, I look forward to, to doing the work and I, I'm very pleased to see a lot of people going into their communities in different ways to start organizing essentially block by block. And I mean, that's how electoral politics should have been there, should have been run for a long time. And we are seeing a a tendency to start organizing that way, even from from electoral politics. But, you know, having meaningful conversations door to door with people about issues that matter for them. But I can't I, I am anticipating the strike coming up for QP and what it might lead to. But I'm also drawing real solace from your quote that reminds us that there are ebbs and flows that we don't, you know, that there another moment will surely present itself and we will need to act. So I guess I hope uh, we can learn from each other and create the structures that you're talking about, ones that work, not the ones that we're currently in, a lot of us, and um, that we can maybe do better, you know, build on each one of these lessons and uh, really push back against um, neoliberalism and the Fords and the Daniel Smiths out there and, and whatnot. I appreciate you, you coming on, John, and sharing your experiences there. I feel like there's a whole lot of other stories there to be told, probably especially around the days of action. Um, if, if there's any like tidbits you'd like to share with us before we go, or you know, maybe you want to leave us with a message of hope, but... You get the last words, my friend. Yeah. Well, I think it is a message of hope. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I think we've just seen something with the education workers happened that, that was absolutely incredible. The reality is perhaps inevitably that it contained within it the limitations and contradictions of the situation we're in and where we are as movements. But but to draw pessimistic conclusions from a situation where 55,000 education workers defied government legislation, that the majority of people in this province supported them and that other unions were on the were, were ready to, to, to actually take solidarity action. I mean, I think it must create in us an incredible sense of hope, an incredible sense of possibility, uh, an awareness of the dangers, an awareness of the incredible barriers that are in our that are in our way. But to to draw anything other than than, than optimism and hope from this situation would be pathetically stodgy. I, I think we have uh, we have we're living in incredible times. We're living in unprecedented times. And we are in a position to unleash unprecedented struggles, struggles that don't just don't just make some difference and stave off some attacks, but that pose fundamental questions about the kind of society that we live in and the possibilities for building a society that's very, very different to this one. So I think this is a this is an amazing time to be alive. And I think we've got incredible we've got incredible uh, struggles ahead of us and they're going to be amazing. Thank you for that, John. And thank you for taking the time again. That that one, that makes me so hopeful because I always am feeling like a revolutionary, sans revolution sometimes. And so to say that these times are hopeful, I think will we'll uplift a lot of people listening. Thank you. That is a wrap on another episode of Blueprints of Disruption. Thank you for joining us. Also, a very big thank you to the producer of our show, Santiago Halu Quintero. 
Blueprints of Disruption is an independent production operated cooperatively. You can follow us on Twitter at BP of Disruption. If you'd like to help us continue disrupting the status quo, please share our content. And if you have the means, consider becoming a patron. Not only does our support come from the progressive community, so does our content. So reach out to us and let us know what or who we should be amplifying. So until next time, keep disrupting.